as you rise up, you commit your heart into the hands of the Lord. Solemnly ask God to speak his word to you and plant that word in your heart. Give you the grace to buy. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we bless you for the opportunity of still coming before your presence as we continue the series and see what she we are so grateful the way you started with us last week. As we go on today and ready to conclude by next week, we still commit our hearts into your hands, O oh Lord. You've called us to serve and give us the grace to respond adequately in Jesus' name. Speak to us today. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. In the book of Luke chapter 12, Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Remember, last week we started the series, I told you, would at the end take about three parts uh, on stewardship. And today we are taking the second segment of series of studies on stewardship. Uh, hopefully, by God's grace, if Jesus tarries, we're going to bring it to a conclusion next Sunday. And our text today is from Luke chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. The topic is faithful stewards of God's possessions. Faithful stewards of God's possessions. Luke chapter 12 verses 42 and 43. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. You will notice here, that there's a search by God for a faithful steward. And this steward is somebody who takes possession of another person's property and handles it very faithfully. And he says, who is that faithful servant? We are looking for that faithful servant. And in the context of what we are discussing today, we're actually looking at it from what we've read about the faithful servant the Lord will make ruler over his own household, giving his possession. So we're looking at stewardship from the perspective of the way you handle the things God handed over to you personally, to you, not to others, to you personally as an individual. You see, when you hand over things to people and give them absolute discretion to do whatever they can with it, and they can operate, have discretion, how they will work on it, you will see you've given them a measure of power relating to that thing they are in control of. And they say power intoxicates, and absolute power intoxicates absolutely, but not for a faithful steward. If you have an example in Old Testament, Joseph, of a person that was given such an absolute discretion, unfettered discretion, to handle another person's goods. Genesis chapter 39. Let's look at Genesis chapter 39, verses 4 to 6. Genesis chapter 39, verses 4 and 6, actually. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 4. In verse 4, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. That's Joseph in Potiphar's house. Look at verse 6 and see the magnitude of the discretion that Joseph had. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not what he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a godly, a goodly person and well favored. He left him with discretion to handle all the properties in the in Potiphar's house. And the scripture say he was a goodly person. He was favored. He was faithful with regard to that. 
You could also look at Joseph in the court of Pharaoh. The same thing. Pharaoh said, everything in all the kingdom, you are the second. Only me will be higher than you in the throne. And by your word shall all Egyptians be bound. And we see in the course of that, Joseph was also very faithful. You see, an unfaithful steward who handles people's possession does not give good report. Take him that in the and put him as a joint signatory to your account in case you travel, in case something happens, let him have access to the account. If he's unfaithful, he would deplete the bank account as a matter of fact. Confide in an unfaithful steward, the card, the password to your credit card or whatever, so that when you are not available, he will help you in picking something and meeting up some bills. He will go and abuse that. Put an unfaithful person as a signatory or joint owner of your real property. You will see that before you know it, it's a different story. I remember a particular case about a woman who came up and he had two real properties and was uh, the son, the only son that could have survived, uh, inherited them, had a problem and went to the prison. Now she was very sick, almost to the point of dying, and cut two relations and said, let me transfer the property in your name so that when I pass on, or even if my son does not come back, you are going to pass it on to my son when he comes out of prison. The son eventually came out. The two people that were given the property, as soon as she died, the other one sold it and pocketed the whole money. The other one also went to court and said, no, he gave it to me. And that was how they dissipated the property. You see, they were stewards, custodians of the property of this woman. But then they abused the stewardship itself. People that are very faithful as stewards of people's possession, they receive a gratitude, they receive commendation, they receive, you know, appreciation because of their own faithfulness. There are occasions we hear stories about home health aids, you know, those that work with people, people that are sick, and they are normally exposed to them when they are terminally ill, and they have the power to abuse them, take their possessions, take their money, or take their credit card. They are vulnerable people. But we have vocations of people that have been so faithful in handling them that when they are passing away, those that are sick will wheel something to them, give them their cars, give them some nice things, say good things about them. You see, people like faithful stewards to come around them. There are parents who know their children very well, and there's a report from school your child was involved in something like he joined the people smoking, um, had drugs. Because they know their children, they are faithful, they are not supposed to get it. They will say, no, not my child. I know this child. It's not my child. No, I know even if I, I keep any money here, the child is not going to touch it. Why? Because they already have been with the child over the years, and they know how faithful the child has always been. That's the point we are making at this point in time. In our days, seeking for faithful stewards, especially in the house of God, is well, like walking the narrow path to find people that are walking there. In a difficult situation, look at Proverbs chapter 20. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 20, in verse 6. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. That's a sad. It's the narrow way to find the faithful person. Are you faithful? As we get into considering what we are doing today, check up front. Are you really faithful as an individual? Last week we told ourselves faithfulness is not just only in the house of God. When all of us are gathered together, Outside, where people don't see you, are you faithful? Sometimes you rent a car, rented car. Sometimes you also take um, crash insurance. If anything happens to it, I'm not involved in it. 
but does it give you a liberty license to now crash the car to now use it and use it as if uh, in where you a manner you are not supposed to use your own personal car that's not being faithful as a matter of fact are you living in a rental apartment the landlord says utilities are involved in your rent and because of that you turn on the utility you allow the water to run 24 7 because the bill is on the landlord but if it's your house or you are paying the utility bills you will not do that as a matter of fact that's not being faithful in the biblical sense of the word and the lord is asking you why would you not do that as a believer god has generously entrusted into our hands possessions of his and the possessions we are considering today come in two parts one all the material substance you have on in the world god has put them into your hands secondly the skills apart from material things God also has put them into your hands. These are things he has put into your hands. Why? Use them as you want. You don't see God personally, but he's monitoring every dollar from your hand to the way you spend it. He's monitoring every skill he has put into you, the way you expend it, the way you put it into use. A day of accounting is coming out there very soon when you will appear before god and give accounts about how you spent the material substance and the skill he has put into you and that's the substance of what we are challenging ourselves today matthew chapter 25 gospel according to matthew chapter 25 i am going to read verses 14 and 15 and then we jump down to verse 19. Matthew chapter 25, look at uh, from verse 14. In verse 14 and 15, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. That's the material substance, his goods. His money, his wealth, his possession. These are talking about physical material things. He gave them to them. Look at verse 15. And don't to one he gave five talents. This one is now talking about skills. To another two and to another one. To every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. He delivered his possession, um, possession and then gave them skills, talents. Look at verse 19. A day of accounting, verse 19. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. A day is coming very soon. God is going to come and then reckon how you use the talents and the goods he has given unto you. But do you know, he has a parameter for rating you. He has a parameter for judging how you use those resources he has put into you. It is from one lens, from one view. All I've given you in respect of expanding my kingdom, how have you applied them? They count before God. If any of them or both of them are applied to the furtherance of the kingdom of God, any other thing you use them for, they don't receive any reckoning before God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verse 18. The scripture says, Deuteronomy chapter 8, 8, 8 verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy father as it is this day. I'm giving you strength to make wealth, strength to generate substance, and then use it to now expand and further my own kingdom. That's essentially the reason I am doing that. You see, David, the king of Israel, realized this. A man after God's own heart. 
Look at 1 Kings chapter 29. In 1 Kings chapter 29, reading from verse 14, David gives us, oh sorry, 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 29 from verse 14. Go there, please. First Chronicles chapter 29 from verse 14. That all he gives you, he expects you to plow it back into his own kingdom for his own work. In First Chronicles chapter 29 verse 14, reading from verse 14 down to 17. First Chronicles chapter 29 from verse 14. 14, but who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee. See, it is acknowledging all everything come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. From what you've given us, we are giving back to you. Look how is it they are giving back to God? Look at the application of that from verse 15. For we are strangers before thee, sojourners as we are all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. O Lord our God, all this stuff that we have prepared to build thee a house. You see, build a house for God. Kingdom days. That's what they are giving was related to. For thy holy name, come out of thy hand, and it's all thine. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and has pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in, thy, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. Now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. It's a project in the house of God. We are offering God for you, offering unto you, God, so that this will be the thing that will happen when uh, eventually you start reckoning. This is how we applied the resources you've given unto us. You know the side scripture we read today and the teaching, what a coincidence. You will notice that Mary, from what we are teaching, because Jesus demonstra demonstrated this practically. If you read the balanced account of the scriptures about that incident, Mary herself saved, had ointment, what one year's wage? Adult class was saying one minimum wage and so on. No, take whatever it is, like in the youth section, whatever level of any you are, maybe you are 200,000 per annum. That 200,000 watts of a substance, you are putting it straight to the Lord himself. Jesus demonstrated for those that were complaining and saying, you are wasting it and this one and so on. Jesus commended her. She's done what should be done. And everywhere the scripture is being preached, all she has done will be mentioned. In other words, a faithful steward that gives sacrificially unto God to further the kingdom, aligns himself with the Bible message, aligns himself with God's own word, aligns himself or herself with God's purpose on earth so that forever and ever, your gesture in being faithful in applying these things to serving God will run with you. Flip it the other way. Is God demanding too much for us? Sometimes we train children. We strain ourselves. We put money together. Shield them from student loan. Even if they had to take it, we still expend money in training them. Can you imagine? And I've seen some parents bemoan that. At the end of all their efforts, the children behave as if the parents don't exist any longer. The parents are anniversary, they give them a bottle of water, nothing substantial to appreciate them. They don't even call, they don't visit, they don't care. And these are people that spend their whole life income on training them. The parents will feel bad. Now if we turn it around to God and say he owns everything and he expects you to honor him, further his kingdom with this, we feel well God is demanding too much. No. Badik by Jesus is telling us something very important. In fact, he expressed it in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16, look at verse 9. Luke, chapter 16, in verse 9. And I say unto you, 
met yourselves friends on the, of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. The substance God has given you, use it here on this side of the kingdom. The kingdom focus, invest it in such a thing that will go beyond here so that when money fails, when the world fails, you go up, the blessing of your sacrificial giving and use proper use of God's possession in your hand will be a thing that will now be part of the reward you are going to receive in heaven. And you will receive those rewards in Jesus' name. I said you receive them in Jesus' name. Three points. Number one, scriptural giving by faithful stewards. Scriptural giving by faithful stewards. Point number two will be services rendered in gratitude by redeemed stewards. Services rendered in gratitude by redeemed stewards. And finally, we look at satisfactory rewards reserved for the faithful stewards. Satisfactory reward reserved for the faithful stewards. In point number one, let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 38. Point one, scriptural giving by faithful stewards. In Luke, chapter 6, reading verse 38. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, in verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the me same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, if you look at this verse of scripture, it contains something very significant. That the degree of your sacrificial giving will trigger the substance, the nature of the return you are going to get. You see, it shall be given unto you. What shall be given unto you? Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, overfilling. And now says, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you. Good measure, shaking together, running over, means you need to stress yourself also, give sacrificially, and then you will receive abundantly. That's essentially what that verse of scripture is telling us about. You have two shoes. You want to give out, give out the better one. That's sacrificial giving. You see, let's not mistake the fact. Giving should cost you something and not just, uh, well, I have these discarded items. I have these items. I don't need it again. And then uh, let me dump it on somebody. And that's it. It doesn't even cost you anything. Good. You look for less privilege. Give out to them. But it's not really that scriptural giving. Scriptural giving, the de literal definition is sacrificial giving. Giving that will kind of cost you something. When you come to God's house and you make a pledge in the house of God, giving means you stretch yourself to meet up that demand and that pledge and honor it and make sure that you honor the pledges in God's house, not just after I finish paying all the bills. If I have leftover, uh, that's when I will remember the pledge I made to God and then I come back to uh, give unto him. No, you don't do that. As you come to fellowship each fellowship day, it's not when you step in, you remember, I forgot my offering. Because when you are planning a trip, you want to take a trip by train, you check your card. Do I have the train card? You show before you step into the train, there will be a ticket to be paid. You have the ticket. When you come to the house of the Lord, there must be offering period. You don't just uh, scratch your head. Yet you took transportation to come. You forgot everything about it. It's only offering time. You start scratching your head. Oh, where is the leftover? Where is the money I don't need now? Let me just put it into God's own offering box. No. Plan to give. You are coming to honor the Lord. You are coming to be with him. Because assuming also you uh, have a privilege of giving any gift to our children, our brethren, our blood-bought blood believers, 
heaven bound believers whom Jesus bought with his blood. Maybe we gave you opportunity, cook meals for them, uh, buy this for them, buy this for the sense of the Lord. What do you do? You go and pick the really things that are of no value and you prepare it in a shoddy manner and you bring to the house of God, which you can't even serve in your own house. Well, they are brethren, I know them, they are lowly placed individuals, they are not as sophisticated as that. No. See it as opportunity. You are honoring God. If you don't do that, it's, it brings this honor to God. Malachi chapter 1. Look at the book of Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, reading from verse 8. The book of Malachi chapter 1. That's the last book before the New Testament begins. In chapter 1, reading from verse 6. Malachi chapter 1 from verses 6 down to 8. Malachi chapter 1 from verse 6 to 8. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Say the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised thy name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for a sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. You see, he's saying, as you pride yourself in giving quality offering to people that are highly placed or you want to impress them, do the same before God. Is it because he doesn't manifest himself immediately and start thanking you or judging you and you think he's, he's lower than the governors and the highly placed people that you are giving offering unto? David set a standard for us to gauge the quality of what we give to God in all regard, especially our material substance. Look at it in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. From the lips of David, you see a quality standard to gauge the nature and the standard of the gift you are bringing to God. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24, look at it in verse 24. Please turn your scriptures open and read along. It will help you appreciate the substance of the message. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. And the king said unto Araun, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God. Of that, we doth what? Yes. I can't offer to God that which has not cost me anything. You see, the issue is we need to emphasize this time and over and over and over. What does it cost you to really serve God? What does your offering cost you before God? What's the offering to God? What does it cost you in material substance? You see, most of us are very diligent. When it comes to our credit cards, we keep record. We don't want to overshoot. We pay the minimum. We pay off the balance. We are thorough about that. When it comes to things like loans we got, we make sure we're paying them diligently. Mortgage bills, whatever it is, uh, line of credit, diligent. We want to maintain proper credit record score. When it comes to IRS debt, maybe you are owing them some money. What do you do next? You make sure you enter arrangement with them and you pay it diligently. We, you don't default at all because you know what it will mean. You sacrificially meet other bills, water, electricity, and whatever it is, every one of them so that you continually receive uh, all that they will be supplied unto you and don't suffer the repercussion about that. 
But then when it comes to God and offering to him or meeting up with our pledges, we keep rolling it over, rolling it over, rolling it over. No, it's not time to do it. When you now do a comparative analysis in your brain regarding these other companies and God, your irrational, the thing you rationalize about it is, well, these other companies, especially IRS, they don't laugh. They wouldn't understand whatever I'm doing. I must meet up and pay everything about them. But for God, oh, God understands my situation. He will understand. He knows what I'm going through. It doesn't matter. Let his kingdom slow down. Let us not uh, join hands and deal with him. He will understand by and large. And then that's on un unfaithfulness on each and every one that gets involved in that. What is more, if you look at the New Testament and the early church, you will see a pattern. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight from verse one. Second Corinthians chapter eight, reading from verse one down to four. It says, "Now." Second Corinthians chapter eight from verse one. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wait of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. They were deeply in poverty, but they kept giving. Look at verse 3. For to their power, I dare record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. This is talking about the brethren in Macedonia. Paul gave an example about them. They were deeply in poverty. And a poor person likely is owing debts. But when it comes to the things about God, they will make up their mind, we are going to meet up with all this. You see, when it comes to unfaithfulness in giving, that's principally the reason many church projects are stalled, including our district church itself. That's principally part of the project. The programs we have, we can't push the buttons too far. We're looking at our resources and limitations we have. People are not faithful in giving, in meeting with the obligations in the kingdom of God. And when sometimes it's ridiculous, it's only maybe when we want to advertise it and make it a public issue, that's when some come out from the cocoon and give. You don't need all these gimmicks to make you pay, pay your obligation unto God. A brother has lost somebody in the midst. We say, help out. A sister has gone into difficulty. Nobody just from the pulpit, that's it. Nobody responds anymore. It's just that. But when we say, let's pass paper or have a list of it, maybe some will now come out and start doing that. No. We are offering unto the Lord. We challenge every opportunity to give. Find it and give. And pledges you've made, don't just sweep them aside and say they are gone. It's Old Testament era. Make every effort. Honor your obligations, even as you honor in respect of other things. Anything short of it, brethren, we need to tell you the gospel truth. Anything short of it is like that rich fool. God prospered him. He had resources. He had the brain. What did he do? He was pulling down his band and saying, let me expand. Let me build more and do this and do that. That's exactly the same thing. When these people were castigating Mary because of the costly spinal oil she gave to the Lord, they were saying it would have been applied to alternative ventures. Yes, the same thing. If you are cycling your wealth, you are thinking of stock business, you put it into. You are thinking of real estate, you can put it into. You are thinking of the village house you are building, you can send the money there and then build it. Even if it's roaches and ants that are occupying them, it doesn't matter. Let the house of God be suffering. And then when I get to heaven, I will take, you can't take that house to heaven. It can't even give you any reward up there in heaven. Wisdom demands you rearrange your thought pattern and then keep moving on. If we ever believe, brethren, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, do we believe that? We believe he is. Then let's believe that the same thing he did in his earthly ministry, he is still doing now. 
this especially in Mark's Gospel chapter 12. What did he do? A time, I'm referring to somewhere, Mark chapter 12, where he sat before the offering table to observe the offering people were giving. You know the story in Mark chapter 12. If he did it in his earthly ministry, he's still doing it. As we pass the offering bag around, as we collect pledges, as we challenge ourselves, Jesus is watching diligently. What is this sister doing? What is this brother doing? The pledges this one has made, where is it with him? In Mark chapter 12, verse 41, very clear. Mark's gospel chapter 12, in verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury. He was there, eyeball to eyeball. And beheld how the people cast money onto the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow. He threw in two mice, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples. You see, it became a public issue. It's no hidden. He called them, come, come. And said unto them, verily I say unto you, that this poor widow had cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her wants did cast in all that she had, even all her living. You see the definition of sacrificial giving by the Lord himself. This lady had every reason to be unfaithful, a widow, nobody fending for her. Look at the, the rich people with her, around her. Look at the, the mansion itself, the temple. She would have said, what my money contribute towards the building of the temple? Oh, there are richer people out there. No. She said, I want to be part and parcel of it. Brethren, when I'm here challenging you about giving to God, it has nothing to do with me personally. When I'm challenging you about giving, it's not, I want to psych you up to help us build the church. It could help. Yes, we will have resources and do what we will do here. But the principal reason is this. The scriptural reason is to raise you up as a believer that will be locked in as part of the faithful stewards in handling resources God has given unto them. It's an exclusive club. It's a club of believers among believers. You need a vision. You need your eyes to be opened up to be in a position to sacrificially give back to God from the substance you have received. It works. And if you're able to be challenged to come into that exclusive club, nothing will ever stop you at every opportunity to plow into the house of the Lord. We have example in the early church, Acts of Apostles. Let's go to chapter 5. But before that, Acts chapter 5. You know in Acts chapter 4, a series of stories began. But we're looking at Acts chapter 5 verse 13. I will give you a summary of the rest of the things before Acts chapter 5. You see an exclusive club that was built up. Exclusive club of faithful stewards with God's own possession. Why can't you enter into that? Why can't we part and parcel of it? All this wealth we are hoarding and recycling and so on, living unto ourselves, where is he going to take us at the end of the day? In Acts chapter 5, verse 13. Are you there? Acts chapter 5, in verse 13. And of the rest, dot no man join himself to them, but the people magnify them. You see the exclusive club I'm talking about? It starts from Acts chapter 4. If you read Acts chapter 4, verses 34 to 37, they sold all their substance, brought the money to them. Then when you get to Acts chapter 5, from verse 1, Ananias and Sapphira pretentiously wanted to join the club and judgment of the Lord came upon them. That's why that verse concluded and saying, the rest doth no man join himself to them, but the people magnify them. You pretenders can come. It's people that will have the vision, the a club of exclusive givers. That's the thing that the scripture is bringing to us at this point. Get back to that and be part of it. Before we go to the second point, I need to reiterate something. When I challenge you about giving, I'm just talking about 90% of your resources because as a child of God, you know that 10% compulsorily belongs to God. 
As a child, somebody gives you $200 as a gift. One thing or the other, maybe liking your parents, take out $20 from it, which is 10%. It's compulsory for God. Now, on the 180 that is remaining, that's the one I'm telling you about. 90% of the money, but 10%, you must apply it to God. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, reading verses 10 and 11. Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me. You see, tithes, bring them in. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, that there shall be not room, there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Bring the tithe. You are earning income, maybe 500 every week. Remove up front that $50 on top. It's dedicated to God. It's not an Old Testament affair. Jesus has found tithing in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Matthew's Gospel chapter 23, in verse 23. In verse 23, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe. You see, they pay in tithe of mint and anise and coming and have omitted the weightier matters of the Lord. They are paying tithe, but they are not obeying the Lord. And look at the response of Jesus, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You ought to pay your tithes, yet you also ought to now not to meet weightier matters of the Lord, judgment, mercy, and faith. Jesus affirmed it. So 10% compulsorily, it has to be dedicated to God. You, don't, you, you are inviting problem if you get into that. Then the 90% that you have left over, you now go and what question will you ask? You will ask not how much can you keep to yourself? But ask the question, how much more of it can I give to God's work? How much can I plow out? Not how much will I keep unto myself. And the Lord will help you be faithful in Jesus' name. I said he will help you in Jesus' name. Uh, we are talking about money matters, correct? We will hear. God will give us grace to hear in Jesus' name. Second point, service rendered in gratitude by redeemed stewards. Services rendered in gratitude by redeemed stewards. Brethren, we are living material things now. We are living uh, money matters now. We've talked about it enough. In this one, apart from finances, we are going to talk about talents that God has given each member of the church for the benefit of the entire church itself. Apart from the material position we've talked about, you know, I told you two areas God is going to judge you, material substance, and then the skills, the talent you have. Each member in the church, he has put talent within them. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 8, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. And what did he do again? And gave gifts unto men. Talking about Jesus Christ, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men for the body. Now jump to verse 11 and see the gifts. From 11 down to 16, he gave some apostles, not everybody, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers and so on for the perfecting of the sense, for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
that we henceforth, you see the purpose of the gift, be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in law, may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body until it define of itself in law. You see, that verse ends in law. And these things we have read show us that Jesus himself has kind of brought gifts and given to every member of the church. At the end of it all, there's no useless member of the body of Christ. You could creep in, you are staying far down towards that side, or you are staying in front of the row or middle of the row. Each and every one of us that's hearing the sound of my voice, God has a purpose in bringing you into this district church, bringing you into the assembly of the saints of the Lord. He has allowed you to be in here because there's a gift you are going to bring out. And he's saying you bring it out in love. Love is a thing that will motivate you to bring it out. Love for God. Otherwise, it's love for the world that is canceling out your bringing out the gifts out there. If you look at the cross, if you look at what Christ did to save you, and you're a member of the household of Jesus, there is something he has put into you with one challenge. Bring it out in love for him that died for you, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I am going to read verses 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 14 to 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading verses 14 and 15. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. That if one man died for all, then we are all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see the point? He died for you. The love of God constrains you now. Show your love for God by being involved in the work of God at any level and at any time. Push yourself to be involved. You see, I'm not talking of merely enrolling in, formally enrolling in the workforce. It doesn't, there are unfaithful workers. We have their names on the register, but they are not faithful. They are there. So you don't need to have your name in my record book, but I encourage you, be a worker. But the point is that there are needs. You can see them openly in the house of God. Whether you are formally enlisted or you can preach the word. You can encourage people. You can see needs. You can exhort individuals. There are talents God has given us, wisdom and knowledge, our thinking pattern to be able to see this is what is needed. This is what should be in the house of God. This is supposed to be the skills you have. Bring them out. Bring them out. God is expecting us to do that. Every good given opportunity, use it to serve God. In Exodus chapter 36, Exodus chapter 36, reading verses 1 and 2. Exodus chapter 36. Verses 1 and 2. It says there in Exodus chapter 36, verses 1 and 2. Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom. Even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. 
even, that's the last part of verse 2, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come onto the work to do it. There were people Moses called, but there were others that were stirred up. And the scripture said God put in their heart to do it. Let there be a stirring about you. Don't be a stranger in God's house. I'll sit down, I'll go out. I'll just come in and that's it. No commit commitment, no involvement, whatever it is. You can imagine for a moment, brethren, Bezaliel and Aholiab must have been established well in Egypt before they left that place. The skills they had is not an overnight skill. They must have been prominent in their business in Egypt and be doing a, good, a lot better, prosperous as it were. But look at them now in the wilderness. Without any payment at all. And there is need in the God's house. And they didn't look back to Egypt. Let me go back and be enjoying what I've been enjoying and the status. No. It's an opportunity and it's for God. Freely, they offer to offer their service unto God. Together with others that were stirred up. Who came up and then were involved in the work of God himself. Are you ready to bring forth your talent? As you look around, we are battling with the IT, the electronic section. We are battling with this one. Are you ready to come up? Carpentry knees, they are bound. Many of you must have skill about that. How many are coming up? You hold on to that knowledge. Is, uh, you are very good in organization. You know how to put this in order. Put this. Maybe a flower is not well placed. You are a florist. You know the better one. What's holding you? You are not coming up. Well, I'm not a worker. Who tells you it's only workers that can do that? There are skilled things you can do. There are things you can bring out yourself to be in a position to actually offer unto God himself cleaning, decoration, whatever it is. People that are out, even our sister faithfully, who does the cleaning? Now, he's not in a working team and so on. He faithfully comes early in the morning, goes around and so on. We're not naming names, but we know that. When the Spirit stirs you up, get going and get doing something. This is your own Father's house. And nobody will get you out from doing what God wants you in Jesus' name. Let there be a stirring up. Let there be a desire. You know, there's a zeal that is normally required when a call comes to work for God. Let's see an example of it in the Old Testament and see if it is there in you. If it's not, why is it not? In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, you see the pride people have in their private businesses is flourishing. We are doing it very well and we want it to be advertised. They place advert here and there. Can't you do it for the work of God? Because the pay is far outstrips what you could get in your secular work with all the efforts you are putting in to expand it. Look inward and think about eternity. First Chronicles chapter 29. I'm reading verses 5 and 6. First Chronicles chapter 29 from verse 5 to 6. The gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver. And for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? There are things he has mentioned, this and this, all manner of work. Who is ready to consecrate? Look at verse 6, the response. Then the chief of the founders and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. They came out willingly. There is need. We want to bring it out willingly and do that. And then as you are working for God, another thing you need to understand is this. Don't let us meet you at the same position every day. Strive to improve yourself. You see, in the world, professionals, teachers, nurses, doctors, lawyers, they have in-service training, professional trainings to improve and perfect their skills so that they keep growing. The same thing with the house of God. Have you been teaching us the scriptures and did the same thing? Instead of going higher, you are going down 
in the way you are delivering and teaching us. No, strive to improve yourself. Strive to come up to higher level. Deliberately make efforts to improve yourself in your area of work. Have you been preaching to us for some years? And we come, you are receding. We are no longer seeing the fire. Nothing is happening. It's just the same repeating your messages. Dry, cut, and nail. No, do something about it. Come up higher. Are you in charge of construction or anything in the house of God? You have a talent to sing for us. Do something. Push yourself to improve on it so that you keep going to higher level. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 in verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Reading therein verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 6, wherefore, it says, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands. Stir it up. Anointing is already imparted. Develop it. Bring it up to higher level. Finish this assignment. This program is gone. Fine. But it's in the past. What do I do for the future? Keep moving on. Keep going ahead. Before you know it, you get to eternity and you have already accumulated a lot of rewards for your diligence in working for the Lord himself. Another thing we need to know, when we are challenging you to come up to offer your service to God, something must be done on you. Let your service to God not be a spring field for you to now get into your private ventures. Let it not be a thing that will bring you into publicity and you divert the glory and honor of God that brought you out to publicity and use it for selfish, um, not, uh, selfish purposes that benefit you personally. No. The scripture says, freely you've received, freely give. Why is it necessary we stamp on this? We're developing our use now. Parents should also be aware of that. And they are coming up very well. We're developing and challenging each and every one of us. But do you know, in our generation today, trace them. Most of the successful Hollywood stars, especially the singers, started as choir in the children's choir. And then their talent come up very well. They start marketing them. And before you know it, from children's choir to Hollywood. Is it them alone? We've seen people from the pulpit. They have eloquence. They can deliver. And the people of the world see them and say, this is it. What are you wasting time in this local church? Come, we have something better for you. From pulpit to politics. And they are gone. People from children's church doing very well. And the thing that brought them to limelight. Before you know it, another assembly is saying, come, come. Or they set up one other whatever quack denominational thing. And they are running from pillar to post because people have appointed them. They are looking for personal gratification. We had, what brought you up in the first place? The house of God. You developed yourself. God poured his talent upon you. Now you realize I can make money for myself. I can stop preaching the word of holiness. I could get into more people and then dear myself to others. No, don't do that. John the Baptist... Because he was a trailblazer, he brought him to limelight. He said, the whole Judah and Israel were flocking to him. But when Jesus appeared on the scene, John said, he must increase, and that would decrease. When the honor and anointing of God from the house brings you to a level that you are now competing with the maker, and you are now selfish. You are thinking more about yourself, uh, more of my business than coming to now minister and so on. More of the, and you come to church, all you need is network connection. Because I'm, I've come up now, you have card at the end. You give them, I'm doing this. Come, this is my office. This is this one. Come and do this. Come and do that. Who are we doing? Who brought you up in that level? Some come to leadership position. We've had cases here. And then see them in prominence. We project them they start organizing some questionable social gatherings and then going behind the scene to connect people and say, come, come, come. Leadership will not even know about that. Who brought you to the prominence that made you connect with them and you're abusing it because of your selfish desire to just benefit yourself? That's what the scripture is telling us. Freely you receive, freely give. Have that attitude to work for God. 
don't compete with your boss. That's what Lucifer was doing, the anointed cherub. He felt at a time, I will be like Almighty. I will compete with him. And then he was brought down very low. But if you think what Christ thinks, if you have the same mind with Christ, if you have the same purpose, shut off all the noise from outside. Whatever trappings they are giving you, stay where you are called. There's a particular position you will be able to put in all you need to make a difference. God is not looking at quantity of what you did. The assemblies you ran to and all the number of people is looking for faithfulness. A pastor in pulpit will receive the same reward as a cleaner out there, just cleaning out there. Have the mind of Christ. There's somebody we'll look at before we look at the last point. That is in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Example of uh, Philip. Paul commended him. Uh, example of Timothy, rather. Paul commended him in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. And if you look at Timothy, it's very remarkable how he was able to be commended. And you see what he passed through before he came to this level. At every point, he could have diverted, but not, Tim not Timothy himself. And that's why Paul commended him in such a way that would be instructive to every one of us. Timothy started serving God as a small child. He talks about his grandmother his mother, and then the faith that came upon him as a youth. He never deviated. Timothy, when he was in ministry, faced challenges in the ministry work. God would have had cause to be diverted and so on. Paul was encouraging him, let no man despise your youth. Stand firm and put in practice what I've told you to do in the location. He stood firm. Timothy could have he was a contemporary of people like Demas, who forsook God's work, having loved this present world. He could have diverted, but he never did that. He stood firm, knowing his call, and he continued steadfastly up to the end. He never even wrote a pistol or anything there. It's just what we know about him is just the snippets Paul was writing about him. But you see a remarkable individual focused on his ministry, moving on to that level. Can't you do it in the little area you are? That's faithfulness. God has given it to you. He's giving you all the skills. He's just watching. It's not that he doesn't know what you are doing behind the scene, but he's telling you from what we are challenging ourselves today, a day of accounting is coming, reckoning is coming. How would I view you? Are we in Philippians chapter 2? Look at it from verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good for comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he had served with me in the gospel. He's reliable. He doesn't backstab. He's a guy that will stand for righteousness and stand for holiness standard. Do exactly what is expected there. He stood with me and he's told us about others. They seek things of their own, not the things that concern Jesus. May the Lord find you faithful in Jesus' name. Finally, very briefly, we look at the third point. Satisfactory rewards reserved for the faithful stewards. Satisfactory reward reserved for the faithful stewards. In Psalm number 126, Psalm 126 in verse 5. Psalm 126, reading there in verse 5. It says, They that sow in tears, what will happen? Shall reap in joy. Sowing is difficult. Giving sacrificially is difficult. We looked at the two parts. Your substance, especially in these days, it's difficult to part with money, bills here and there, and demands here and there. Especially people that have other dependents from here and outside, and they are beckoning on you. But the point is balanced things. God is faithful. And if you come to a situation, you have option of 
giving or not giving so that you pay your debts. How can you, in getting your principal, you must always tithe, you must always give because that's what activates God's reward back to you. When you give faithfully, he gives you in such a way you pay off all those bills. Your skills, it's not easy to bring them out. I know people that are owed to maybe two jobs or whatever it is and then pay on gas and everything to be in fellowship and work for God. It's, it's involving. It's not easy. But God is saying, damn me, do that. That's what I'm expecting. That's part of why I'm saying, Paul said, I bear the mark of Jesus on my body. What is that mark of Jesus in you? That sacrificial giving and offering and being diligent in following the Lord all through the way. You've laid your hands on the plow. You are not going back. You are not of them that draw back onto perdition. You keep marching on. That's stewardship. That faithfulness. A soldier that will be able to please him that has called him into battle. Surely, maybe sometimes the reward doesn't come immediately. Uh, yes, unless you are a gambler. That's why you are putting, God will give me this. I'm putting 100, tomorrow I'm getting 1,000. God might be silent over the period, but surely the reward of God is coming and you have that reward in Jesus' name. It's not also unscriptural for you to, you know, plow yourself into giving and into service of God with expectation of reward. It's not unscriptural. That's what really you are motivated to do. Remember Moses. For he forsook the pleasures of Egypt because he wanted to enjoy the riches in Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord, the same thing. Because of the joy before him, set ahead of him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. There's an expectation coming. There's a payday coming. And God is telling you, don't you have that vision? There's a payday out there. We started with Matthew 24, where God called the talent, the uh, servants, and gave them his position, and then gave them talents. Remember, a day of reckoning came, and the faithful stewards, he said, Come, you've been faithful in little, go and have these cities. Enjoy them, and it's forever and ever and ever and ever. And finally, Revelation chapter 14. You will see the book of Revelation opening the curtains. As to how it will be that day. When you will appear before God on that glorious day. Revelation chapter 14. Look at uh, verse 13. Revelation chapter 14. Reading therein verse 13. And I had a voice from heaven saying unto me, write. Please open your Bible, everybody. Let's look at it. Saying unto me, write. See what will be written about you that day. Revelation chapter 14 in verse 13. Are we there? One, two, go. Let's read it. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Enduring work you did in the kingdom of God. Not you are helping. It's only your relations you are helping. Not you are sacrificing. It's only because your wife is involved. Because they won't, don't want them to throw you out. No. Let it be kingdom focused. You are no longer people of this world. You belong to God. Jesus said, these are my brothers and sisters. Those that are here and do. So everything about you will be kingdom focused. And that's it. The work you do therein will follow you. Your works will follow you for good in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and go to God in prayers and ask God. As we get through the second segment in this series, bless God for what you have and ask God to help you. And look at the positions you have from a different perspective. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Glorify God with everything you have. Bring your body a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Together with your substance, everything you have, your talents, lay them on the altar. God needs them now. We don't need them when we go to heaven. We need them now. Bring them up. Let the house of God move forward. Let it move forward. Let you be part of the people that will push the work of God ahead. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord and ask God to help you.
Are you praying? Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Talk to him. Check all the resources that pass through you. The money you've earned from the time you started working in this country till now. How many of them have found their way into the work of the Lord? Time was in the past. People will come in anonymously, drop fat envelope in the offering money. I don't want anybody to know. Or they could issue a check and say, this is it, just to support the work of God. Or time was when we were having some programs. People would say, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so on. Why is it not happening now? We've lost our vision. We've lost our vision. Even faithfulness in paying tithes and offering is like, oh, that is uh, doing God a great favor. No. From the Bible, it's not what it should be. You should wake up to your responsibility. Look at the Macedonian believers. Their great plight of affliction, difficulties that they were facing, the apostles were even pitying them, but they said, no, no, no. They entreated them, have us so that we benefit from the benefit God has made available for those that sacrificially give. David had the option of being told, Take the land. I don't pay anything. He said, no, I will not offer God a thing that does not cost me anything. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? Are you doing that? What is the quality of your service? The talents you have. Are you reserving it for your secular job alone? How many of them are you using? Once in a week, don't you think you could challenge yourself to preach the gospel, to reach out to other people, to send out tracts, to call people and encourage them? Look into the house of God. God is tiring you up. There are things you can do which other pers no other person can do for the benefit of the whole body. Why do you want to go to the grave with them? Whatever your hand find it to do, do it with all your might and labor because there is nothing. No work where you are going. This is the time you can make a difference and work for God. Remember how many years ago you were still a little person. Now 10 years is added. What have you done for God within the 10 years? 20 years. What have you done for God within the period? They say? You are just a passenger in the house of God. When you should be a person that should be carrying others to higher level, higher level you are still dull of hearing. Are you developing yourself? Even in the area of the work you are doing, are you deliberately making effort? <clears throat> Let me read the Bible more. Let me develop myself. Let me train myself to be more involved in this area I am doing the work of God. Pray, repent, and then call upon God for mercy.